be destroyed. It, look, let me just say it the way it should be interpreted. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And perish means be sent to the place of torment and agony where Lazarus was. Let's not kid ourselves. This place is real. It's agony and torture. But the Jehovah Witnesses won't have it, will they? They've even exaggerated the word there for um, belief and made it into a word that suggests effort. There is no effort. Hebrews chapter 12, quite a handy setup they've got here. Hebrews 12 and 2. Don't attribute anything to yourself when it comes to the religious life. So then, because we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, who do you think they are? Who do you think the great crowd of witnesses are? They're the people that have died that are in the presence of the Lord. Their body's in the ground, but they're in the presence of the Lord. All the millions of believers that are watching this play out from heaven. Let us also throw off every weight. That's everything we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. There's nothing we need to do. We just need to believe in Christ. And the sin that so eagerly entangles us, the sin that so eagerly entangles us is brought about by thinking there's something we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad instead of just accepting that Christ has um, secured eternal life for us and let us run with endurance the race set before us as we look intently at what? At the chief agent and perfecter of our faith, at the um, author and finisher of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, it comes back to what Christ has done, not what we do or think we can do or not do. Because when we think there's something we can do or not do to make God happy or stop him, stop him from being sad, it entangles us in sin. So we're to keep our eyes on Christ, who said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And just as they said in Romans chapter 6, and they hung themselves with this one, that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life by Christ Jesus our Lord. And of course this prophecy kept going. We know that there was the Mosaic Law Covenant where they had to sacrifice animals. And we're actually studying about that in our Watchtower study today. And these animals that they sacrificed were for atonement of sin. Of course, we know that these, this atonement was temporary. And that's why they had to continually offer these sacrifices for that atonement of sin according to the Mosaic Law. But we also know that eventually Christ would come about. And Christ would be the final sacrifice and would be that propitiatory sacrifice, which would mean it would be only a one time that would need to be given, and it would last Correct. forever. I have to say that he explained that very, very well. That Christ was offered once for all, for time and eternity, never to be offered again. And you'll find all this, this subject in um, Hebrews. I think it's particularly chapter 10. Just bear with me for a minute. Um, I'm just going off, yeah, if you go right into this, look. On the contrary, these sacrifices are a reminder of sins year after year because they had to offer them continually. So when he comes and in, came into the world, this is Christ, he says, sacrifice and offering you did not want, but you prepared a body for me, which means a body that was to be sacrificed. And it goes on. But by the Lord Jesus Christ, he offered one sacrifice for sins, for all time, one sacrifice, once and for all, for all time, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he sacrificed his only begotten son, so that whoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
And there it is, that one sacrifice for all, forever, for eternity, never to be offered again. So he, I have to say, he, did, he explained that perfectly. Now, I'm sure you all know about the Titanic. You've all heard the story of the Titanic, this massive ship. At the time, it was the largest sailing vessel that had ever been built. And on its maiden voyage, struck an iceberg and sank. And you've probably seen movies, renditions of it. So the ship is sinking. The Titanic all the lifeboats was are a gone. British luxury. Panic everywhere because you, all the passengers know who are not already in lifeboats that they're most likely going to die. You're standing there, you're saying, well, <laughs> I guess it's over. Somebody says to you, 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 points to you, says, I want you to have the seat on this lifeboat of my only son so that you can live and you survive. Would you be grateful to that person? Well, this sacrifice is very similar to the sacrifice that Jehovah God made with his son, Jesus. That was what his sacrifice was so that we would have that opportunity to live, to survive that drowning, as it were, and survive. So he's really preaching the gospel here and he's got himself into a bit of a tiz, hasn't he? I want to come back and just go over that again. You, 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 points to you, says, I want you to have the seat on this lifeboat of my only son so that you can live and you survive. He's done a great job Would you here. be grateful to that person? My word, you'd be grateful. Well, this sacrifice is very similar to the sacrifice that Jehovah God made with his son, Jesus. That was what his sacrifice was so that we would have that opportunity to live, to survive that drowning, as it were, and survive. Now, what was Jesus' resurrection proof of? If you'll turn with me to 1 Peter 3.18. 1 Peter 3.18. Oh, he's game going to 1 Peter 3 because there's Jesus' resurrection. It says, for Christ died ascension. once for all time for sins, a righteous person for unrighteous ones, in order to lead you to God, he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now, we know about Jesus. Now, look at that. He was made alive in the spirit. Similarly, we are in the spirit. That's why when we die, we get taken to be in his presence. Is dying, But we also need to remember that if Jesus had not maintained his integrity, during his life on earth, his sacrifice wouldn't have been enough because a perfect man had to die willingly in order to make up for that Adamic sin. Now, God had to die. I want to show you a passage. This guy is not going to show you this passage. Who do you think Christ's blood, the blood was that Christ shed? I think the Watchtowers tried to translate this out, but I'm sure... That might be in here still. Yeah, see, they've gone, which he purchased with the blood of his own son. No, you go to the Parallel Bible, Bible Hub, and Parallel Acts, let's do this quick, Acts 20, and verse 28. And you will find that Christ's blood was God's blood. Now we want to get the parallel version of this. And let's see what it says. Keep watch. Uh, well, just second part of the verse. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he purchased or bought with his own blood. Whose blood was Christ's blood? God's blood. Um, shepherd the God, God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood. Whose blood was Christ's? God's blood. I knew the um, Watchtower translated it out. They mistranslated it deliberately to suit their doctrine. They've got which he purchased with the blood of his son. That's a mistranslation that is not in the text. Terrible mistranslation. 
um, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So whose blood was God's? Well, whose blood was Christ's? God's blood. God, which he purchased with his own blood. God purchased us with his blood in Christ. I know many of you don't understand that, but you cannot change the idea and the fact that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. The Word became flesh. So Christ lived as a perfect man in a perfect way. Uh, if you'll turn with me to Acts 17.31, please. Acts 17.31. He's tossing around the scriptures here. He's not as confident as he usually is. It says, Because he has set a day on which he purposes to judge the inhabited earth in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and he has provided a guarantee to all men by resurrecting him from the dead. So it was Jesus' resurrection which was a proof in itself. Of course, he was resurrected as a perfect man who died as a perfect man, and his resurrection was an example of what would happen to those who Jehovah God had in his memory in the last days. God, Jehovah God had in his memory. You show me one passage where it says that people go to God's memory. Jesus didn't teach that nonsense. We go into God's presence. Oh, this is another theological abuse and fail. Um, Acts 24, 15, if you'll turn there with me. Acts 24, 15. says, and I have a hope toward God, which hope these men also look forward to, that there is going to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. So there he goes. He's just hung himself. He's absolutely hung himself. Let's open this right up. The resurrection of the righteous is here when Christ returns to the clouds. Behold, I tell you a mystery, 1 Thessalonians 4. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the sound of the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Then we who are alive shall be caught up together to meet them in the air. And we'll always then be with the Lord, comfort one another with these words. The resurrection of the unjust is over here. The great white throne judgment. If your name's not written in the Lamb's book of life there, my goodness me, you go to the bottomless pit. But the Jehovah Witnesses aren't going to tell you that because they don't want to know about it. Charles Taze Russell believed all this, but it got, um, it got, what's it called, lost as other people tried to take over the organization. So we're promised a resurrection. We are promised in God's word a resurrection. So it's not something that we can, well, maybe it's going to happen. We can have absolute faith that this resurrection will take place. So the question comes, resurrection to where? Where are we going to be resurrected to? Oh, isn't this going to be interesting, viewers? I'm got to, I've got to put this up. Oh my goodness, this is going to be really interesting. Let me get this right. Why is there two of those? Hang on, let me fix this up. I've gone well over time, but it's one of my favorite subjects. It's the whole gist of the New Testament, isn't it? Right, where are we going to be resurrected to? Well, the first resurrection's here to meet the Lord in the air. Let's see what this gentleman has to say. All right, heaven or earth? Well, if you'll turn with me to Revelation 14, oh, we're gonna read no. verse one and the latter part of verse four. Revelation 14. We're gonna read verse one. I have an illustration for this. Then I saw and look, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 
who have his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. And turn with me to the latter, parts of, latter part of verse 4. These were bought from among mankind as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Okay, so this first resurrection, this first fruits, the Bible calls it. Now, wait a minute. We've got to get this right. Now, we're up in Revelation 14. Viewers, we're up in Revelation 14. What they've got to realize, and we've got to realize, is the rapture of the church has taken place. Now, the consummation, the completion. See, the first resurrection is a process of events. There's a number of events that take place to complete the first resurrection. And the first resurrection is completed this way. You have the dead in Christ rise first. Then those who are alive um, are together go up to meet the Lord in the air. That's the beginning of the first resurrection. That's the beginning. Then we're reading about uh, here, Revelation 14. Now, I just want to make this a little bit bigger for you to be fair. So the beginning of the resurrection, the first resurrection, starts here with the church. The believers are taken out, either at the start of the tribulation, the middle of the tribulation, or before the consummation of Armageddon. But something that a lot of people don't know about the 144,000 is they come in, and this is still part of the first resurrection, and the 144,000 are released during the Great Tribulation period. And what they do is they round up, as it were, people who turn to Christ during this period. And the 144,000 take out what's known as the Tribulation Saints to be with the church. And this is um, made even clearer in Revelation 19. Now, I'll see if he goes to Revelation 19 or if he just hovers around here because you've got the 144,000 have been mentioned and I need you to know that the job of the 144,000 is to come in and take out the tribulation saints. And that's when the first resurrection is completed. Now, we'll just jump up to 19 for a minute just so I can show you that it says the first resurrection is completed and it's up in 11 through 21 I saw heaven open and look a white horse and the one seated on it called faithful guess who that is the Lord Jesus Christ they haven't taken out the linguistic rule so they're in credit in Christ as God faithful and true and he judges and carries out carries on war in righteousness. His eyes are a fiery flame, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but he himself. Now this is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He has a name written that no one knows but himself, and he is clothed with an outer garment stained with blood. Guess who that is? The Lord Jesus Christ. But the watchtower, I don't know why, but they've missed the divine application as Christ as God in the linguistic rule in calling him faithful and true. So they've described him as God. With blood, and he is called by name the Word of God. And again, they've given him the divine application as being God himself. Also, the armies in heaven were following him on white horses, and they were clothed in white. Now this is up here where he comes a second time, but this time he'll appear to end Armageddon. And they were clothed in white, clean, fine linen. Out of his mouth produced, he produced a sword, sharp, long sword with which to strike the nations, and he will shepherd them with a rod of iron. Moreover, he treads the winepress of fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And again, see God Almighty, there's the linguistic rule. There's God himself, God the Father, but Christ is God as well as God's Word. On his outer garment, 
Yes, on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings. And again, here we go. And Lord of Lords. They are pronouncing Christ as King. We've got to get up to verse 21. <clears throat> and I think we should jump. Um, what I want to do, I'm going to type in a word search. Uh, no, not, no, 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 no. I'll go here and do it. I just want to find resurrection because resurrection, resurrection, bear with me. And we want the revelation passages for this. Come on. Here, there's two. And there is one in 11 and one in 20. Okay, so it says here, this is the first resurrection completed. Okay, so let me just say this. And I saw thrones with a point a judge had seated upon them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been executed for their witness to Jesus and proclaiming the word of God during the tribulation. Those who never worshipped the animal or its statue and had not accepted its mark upon their foreheads or their hands. This happens in the resurrection. Guess who pulls out these souls? The 144,000. Okay. Um, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the millennial age. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. That is the great white throne judgment where the wicked dead come up to be judged. The second death cannot touch them. The second death, which is the sinner's doom, cannot touch the church, the believers. Um, the second death cannot touch them. Where am I? And the rest of the, this is the first resurrection completed. Happy and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. So the first resurrection spanned from the rapture through to the taking out of the tribulation saints by the 144,000. The second death cannot touch such men. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for the thousand years. So everybody that's resurrected, this is the good news here because if you're resurrected before the tribulation as a believer in Christ, you don't go through all this trouble. If you turn to Christ during the tribulation, great tribulation period, you're rescued eventually by the 144,000 and taken out. Um, uh, if you do die for Christ, your spirit and soul will go to be with him and then your body will be raised very similarly to the rapture. Um, and then that is the first resurrection. Can you see? The first resurrection is a span of events. It's not just one event. It begins with the church of being taken out, but it goes right through the tribulation to where the tribulation saints and Old Testament saints are all taken out to be with the church. And then Christ comes and saves Israel. That's a deeper look into the theology of it. But the watchtower jumps straight up. They just dodge the rapture and jump straight up to the second coming of Christ. And that doesn't work. See, that's just not integral. Was to be to heaven. 144,000 bought from the earth to serve as kings and priests, along with Jesus Christ, ruling over the earth. So if we think about God's original purpose for mankind, God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, told them to be fruitful, become many, fill the earth. If they had not sinned, where would they be today? Think about that. They would have had children. They would have continued to develop this paradise earth. And their progeny would be still alive and they would still be alive on the earth today in the paradise that God intended for man. We can read about this in Psalm 3729, if you'll turn there with me. Psalm 37, verse 29. 
which says that the righteous will possess the earth and they will live forever on it. So we have 144,000 that are going to be resurrected, many of them have been already, up to heaven to rule as kings and priests over the earth. And we have another. Now he's just made a, a very strong but erroneous theological statement, theologically abusive statement. He said there's going to be 144,000 who will be resurrected, many of them who have been already. When? How? Where? Where does it say that? There's no theological substance for that statement at all or anything of what he's saying at the moment. Multitudes of people who will live forever on a paradise earth. Now, the other question comes, does that mean you have to die in order to make it into this paradise? Well, there's another scripture that we can look at. Revelation 7, if you'll turn there with me. Now he's going to use Revelation We're going to read 7. verses 9 and 14. It says, After this I saw and look, a great crowd. Now wait, we need to get our... Let's get our thing here. Revelation 7 on the chart is here. So he's in here. Now, the great crowd is the church, but let's just see what he comes up with. Which no man was able to number out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, yeah, that's dressed the in white robes, and there were palm branches in their hands. In verse 14. So right away I said to him, My Lord, you are the one who knows. Basically, who are these people? And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Of course, this is symbolic that their robes were cleansed in Jesus' blood and therefore they were made white and they lived through this great tribulation on into the new system of things. So we have 144,000, which are in heaven, or will be in heaven. We have those that are resurrected to life on the earth and we have this other great crowd that survives into the new order through the Great Tribulation. <clears throat> He's First all over Corinthians the shop. 1526, and we're going to turn there, says that death is to be brought to nothing. So if you'll turn there with me, 1 Corinthians. Oh, he's walking on shaky 15, ground now. 1 Corinthians, the Great Resurrection. Verse 26. Um, chapter. And the last enemy, death is to be brought to nothing. So a simple answer to the question posed uh, in the title of this talk, is death the end of it all? Clearly the scriptures say that it is not the end of it all. Death will be brought to nothing. Revelation 21, 3 and 4, which we all know, we don't have time to read, says that death, sickness will be done away with, mourning will be done away with. These things will end. And that's the promise that we have from Jehovah God and from Jesus Christ. Another scripture that talks about this is Daniel 12, 13. If you'll turn there with me, more oh, proof my. from the Bible. Daniel 12, verse 13. And maybe this is what Martha was referring to when she first spoke with Jesus Christ. But as for you, go on to the end. You will rest but you will stand up for your lot at the end of the days. Just as our song pointed out, he will call, the dead will answer. They will live at his command. Now, was Lazarus the only resurrection that Jesus made? The answer is no. There's others. In fact, turn with me to Luke chapter 7. We're going to read verses 13 through 15. Luke chapter 7, verses 13 through 15 and we have uh, we have an illustration for this as well it's a long sermon this one isn't it when the Lord caught sight of her he was moved with pity for her and he said to her stop weeping 
With that, he approached and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. Then he said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and started to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Think about that. Of course, this is the widow of Nain. Funeral procession, Jesus felt pity for this woman, brought her son, her only son who had died, back to life. Just, just amazing. Luke chapter 8, verses 52 through 56 is another one. Turn there with me, if you will. Luke 8, and this is, we have another illustration, 52 through 56. But people were all weeping and beating themselves in grief for her. So he said, stop weeping. She did not die, but is sleeping. sleeping. Once again, Jesus said, she was sleeping exactly at this they began to laugh at him scornfully because they knew she had died but now let me ask you something is sleeping a cessation of a person no sleeping is when you're still conscious whether it be subconscious or not you do not go back to the mind of god when you die but he took her by the hand and called to her child get up and her spirit returned and she rose immediately and he ordered that something be given her to eat well her parents were beside themselves but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened and we look at the expressions in these parents faces we can well imagine how they felt when they had lost their daughter and this man this jesus just basically said get up child and she did they were besides themselves with joy. One more scripture we're going to read, and that's Luke 20, 38, if you'll turn there with me. And this shows how Jehovah God looks at the dead. That's Luke chapter 20, verse 38. It says, He is a God, not of the dead, but of the living. The living. Exactly. They... Now listen. He, now, now listen, please, for a minute. He's just walked straight in and fell down a bare hole. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, children of this system, the children of this system of things, marry and are given in marriage. But those who have been counted worthy of gaining that system of things and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. In fact, neither can they die any more. For they are like angels, and they are God's children by being children of the resurrection. This is putting man in an eternal state. But that the dead are raised up, even Moses made known in the account about the thorn bush, when he calls Jehovah the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and of Jacob. You know why? Because where was Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? In God's presence. Their bodies were in the ground, but they themselves were in God's presence in spirit, in their spirit. He is not the God of a cessation of consciousness who takes people back to his mind, but the God of the living. For they are all living to him. Jesus was saying they're alive with him. They are all living to him. So think about that. Our dead loved ones, who we miss so desperately, in the eyes of Jehovah God, are still alive. They're just sleeping. They're just resting. All he has to do is call as that song. He just said that himself. They're still alive. I want to play that again. Listen. So desperately. In the eyes of Jehovah God, are still alive. They're still alive. Abraham, and Isaac are still alive because they're still still alive in their soul and spirit, in God's presence with Him. They're just sleeping. They're just resting. All He has to do is call, as that song says, and they will answer. They will live at His command. Just think about that. It's 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 an emotional thing to even think about as we, almost everyone here, probably maybe all, have lost loved ones in death. 
So how would this resurrection happen? Where are they going to go? We don't really know. Are we going to receive instructions maybe in the Watchtower or some other magazine still to, still to come that says for the relatives and loved ones of so-and-so, go to such and such a place at such and such a time and, and welcome them back? Or like maybe some of the illustrations that we've had at conventions and so on, all of a sudden you turn the corner in your house and your loved one is there. What a load of nonsense. Jesus told us in Luke chapter 16, didn't he? Let's remember what he said. Luke chapter 16. I better put 16 there. Luke 16. They went in the Old Testament time to Abraham's bosom or Sheol, the place of torment and agony. Now when people die that believe in Christ, they go straight to be with the Lord. So what nonsense is he talking about? Who, who had died long ago? I mean, I think that would be overwhelming. Um, we really don't know how it's going to happen, but we have some illustrations. Um, you'll go to the first one. This looks, looks to me like it's the father that is resurrected. It can't be sure, but the, the family is running to him, or if it's the other way around, I don't know. But he's coming from the gravestone, so it apparently is the father. And the next, the next one? Well, I would tend to think that the child was resurrected. And of course, in each of these other examples, we don't know. Um, final picture. Oh, actually one more. Yes, look at all Good the people pictures. that are that are being resurrected. And of course, uh, this mother and daughter, one of them was resurrected. Don't know which one. But going back to Lazarus, Jesus standing outside the cave, said, Lazarus, come out. Maybe he'd be saying, wife, if you lost your wife, come out. Husband, if you lost your husband, come out. Daughter, if you lost your daughter, come out. Grandma, grandpa, whoever, put name, whatever name you want, come out. Because we are promised that he will call the dead will answer. What a wonderful time that will be. Good ending, but a theological fail overall. This is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, theologist. Thank you for joining me and bye for now.